Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Nashville Tour Stop Podcast. Thank you for joining us this week. Special edition, we've got Smithfield in the house. We've got Trey and Jennifer. Welcome to the show, you guys. Thanks. I feel very special. Thanks for having us. It's my pleasure. And before we get into the episode, I want to talk about what we were just chatting about. I slid into your DMs asking you to be on the show. I think it was it was at least episode one or two of the podcast back in 2020. Yeah. And you just discovered the the message request in your uh, in your inbox. Yeah. And it's legit. We did confirm that Jen's not just a jerk. <laughs> I'm not a jerk. Um, yeah, this show has been, I guess, two years in the making. Um, I, you know, Trey and I run the Smithfield account, as I was saying earlier, and I'm really bad about checking my personal messages, my personal Instagram just in general. I mean, I haven't even had it very long, and I hardly ever post on it. But, uh, yeah, I found your message, and I felt <laughs> so bad, and I was like, there's no way he's going to get back to me two years later but i just thought hey if he's still doing this podcast we would we'd love to be on it so <laughs> i had honestly forgotten that i'd even sent it so i'm glad you responded <laughs> as you would after two years yeah yeah <laughs> as anybody would <laughs> yeah i remember when i first started the show i was reaching out to everybody like i'm sure i dm'd like miranda lambert and the foo fighters and eventually yep. i knew one person was going to be like Hey, look at that message. Well, maybe we'll go do that. Yeah. Hey, you and here got we to. are. We made it. Here we, we are two it. years later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Call it a uh, call it a slow play. Yeah. Here's the long game there. <laughs> exactly. Playing the long game. But I'm glad we've got you on. I'm excited to have you. I've actually been a fan of yours for uh, several years now. I saw you play CMA Fest 2019, correct? Wow. Yeah. That was like a lifetime ago now. That was a lifetime like. yes. ago. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, 2019 Walk of Fame stage at CMA Fest. That was a great show, too. I think it was the Chevy breakout stage, but in the Walk of Fame park. Yes. So you're, you're close. One and the same. Yes. Really. Yeah, right there. It was our biggest um, stage we had played at CMA Fest Was that Fest your first yet. CMA show? No, actually, it was our seventh, maybe? Sixth wow. or seventh? So we started out, like, 2012, we played a little side stage mm-hmm. at the Hard Rock stage. Yeah, um, like for five then, people. <laughs> yeah, for like five people. And then for a few years, we played the Hard Rock stage, cool. um, proper slot. And then we went to the Hall of, or, uh, Walk of Fame stage, Chevy stage, whichever you like. Yeah, the Chevy breakout stage. Breakout stage. The breakout stage. Breaking and I'd out. say you have formally broken out. Thank you. <laughs> well, what, yeah, because we played the stage. So yeah, you know, just, depends on the day the you ask. You ask, but so yeah. I want to usually start every episode by asking people how I had met them as guests. But uh, since I've never actually gotten to meet you guys face to face before, <laughs> I would like to ask you how you two met each other because you are a dynamic duo, as it were. Can you uh, can you give some background into what it was like? starting the band if it's if it's i know you're at least 10 years old but yes uh, yeah tell me how you we're guys older got started. than that we're older than that because we met when we were little kids so i met trey when i was 10 years old and he was 12 um and then our families go back like three generations in the same oh, wow. s- small town that i'm from which is waxatchee texas shout out uh, most people don't know where that's at so if you know where dallas is it's 30 minutes close to dallas so Um, Our grandparents, they went to high school together, and our parents went to high school together, and our families did New Year's Eve parties and Fourth of July parties together. Sweet. So, yeah, I saw Trey a few times a year um, at our family's gatherings, and um, we would always get up on the fireplace and and sing for the family. Never together, but but we had been singing since we were both little kids, just not together. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, but in college, um, Trey was in a rock band. I grew up doing country music my whole life, and uh, Trey's rock band bro- broke up. And his cousin was at my Thanksgiving table and said, you know, Jen, I've watched you two sing separately your whole lives, and I just think you'd be amazing together. And uh, I felt compelled to not say no because he is a, <laughs> our grandparents talk, you know. Or he's Get the a, grandma guilt if you don't. Yeah, longtime family friends. And so I— uh, I said, yeah, sure. Tell him to reach out to me. And and so he did. And he came over and, and uh, we sang a Keith Urban song. Nice. And just discovered that like, oh, wow, like we actually do sound really great together. Like our blend mm-hmm. of our harmony is really special. That's kind of like the heart of Smithfield is how we sound together. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we've been chasing that ever since. But it, it started when we were kids. That's cool. It's kind of a like a I don't want to say a platonic like a early start because you just you never expected there to become like the next big thing the next duo the next band and right. it little did you know someone's uh cousin was like maybe these guys would perform well together i guess we owe her quite a bit right 
Yeah. <laughs> I guess we have to include her in the acceptance speech one day. Was it one of those magical moments where you guys were singing together and it both you both kind of realized at the same time where you're like, oh, dang, this is actually really good. Yeah, yeah. I'd say so. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I think, it was the, I think it was the first time we ever sang together, really. Yeah, we, I mean. We both knew it was something cool. Our lives changed that day. I think you came over. And I don't think we said it out loud that day. Like, I think you sent me a Facebook message later that you were like, hey, I think this is. Remember this Facebook? Was, yeah. The original sliding into <laughs> the your OG, DM. That's what yes. we're going to start saying soon. Like right now, it's like, remember MySpace. Pretty soon it's going to be mm-hmm. remember Facebook. Isn't that crazy? Um, yeah, I, I do remember you sending me a message like saying like. Were you I, on each other's top eight? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good. I, I definitely, had, I definitely I had Tom was there. MySpace. Tom was there for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that was still a thing then. Maybe it was, but I, it was a Facebook message where I think it was. Yeah, we both were just confessing, you know, how we this has been our dream and, and it never worked out separately as kids. You know, like I had tried to come to Nashville when I was younger and never worked out for me and wanted this my whole life. And and I honestly, at that point, was thinking about just going on the business side because I was like, I just want to be around music. I love mm-hmm. music and I want to be in Nashville. And I'd sort of given up on maybe being an artist um, until that day. And so, yeah. And I was actually the same way. I'd kind of given up on wanting to be an artist. I was going to be like production, recording, engineer. Mm-hmm. Um, do you still do any of that now? I do, actually. I produce all of our music now. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That means you uh, you work with someone who's clearly got a good ear. <laughs> uh, no. you, you can be the judge of that. Go listen to our Spotify. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's since the beginning of the year, I kind of took over the production role and it's been really fun. That's great. So do you uh, have like a home studio or are you actually out recording somewhere else? Uh, I do have a home studio, but like, you know, I'll outsource guitars and drums cool. and stuff, overdubs and things like that. And I'll you know put it all together in my studio. Are you working with session musicians on all of your records, or are you playing everything? Yeah, actually. Uh, it's oh, a, go ahead. No, it's it, it's a little bit of half and half. I'll play a lot of the acoustic guitars and cool. pianos and you know different pads and stuff like that, and then electric guitars and bass and drums. I'll Great. just kind of outsource. That's awesome. So when you perform live, do you just have your like rhythm guitars as yourself, so you don't kind of just feel naked on stage? Totally. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, I do feel naked on stage without it. That's a great description. Um, yeah, no, I just have my acoustic guitar that I play with, cool. just rhythm guitar. Yeah. That's great. And then we run tracks in the live show that kind of help it sound just like the record. But I was going to say over the years, like Trey didn't always produce our stuff. So we got to work with, you know, A-list session players for years. So mm-hmm. you get to know them through working on projects with them. So when Trey took over kind of as the production role, it was nice to have – you know, that pool of players that right. we already knew. So yeah. it's still the same quality. It's just a different person leading it, you know. So when did you both actually relocate permanently to Nashville? Ten years ago in June. Yeah. So you just had your, your 10-year anniversary our, then. Our Nashversary. Yeah. Your Nashversary. <laughs> We've been here a decade. Yeah. We moved here in, in 2012. Um, we got a record label offer very, very quickly. Okay. So we were like, man, Nashville's easy. Like, we're going to be famous in two <laughs> years. This is like, this is awesome. Um, sadly, that record label folded before we were ever able to go to radio. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was heartbreaking. Um, they also didn't give us our record back. They Whoa. Won- yeah. Yeah. They wanted a hundred thousand dollars. Whoa! And yeah. we're like, seriously, two broke kids from Texas. We're like, we don't have a hundred grand. <laughs> it's like, what around. part of you makes me think that I just have a hundred k burning a hole in my wallet? Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. So that record. That is... was a tough lesson to learn right off the bat. But but you know what? A necessary lesson because everything that you go through, all those different trials, teach you something, and you take it with you. So I'm That's sure right. every subsequent deal, there has been a lot more vetting to make sure that you're not going to lose a record again. Yeah, we're definitely a little more careful. Yeah. (laughs) Understandably so. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, after going through that, and then we also went through another label publishing type deal later on, um, you know, 2020 was the first year we took power into our own hands. After going through those types of deals, we went, man, like, we know how to do a lot of this now. We've learned, you know, a lot of lessons from making mistakes. Right. Um, and so taking that power back in your own hands and owning our masters for the first time and trying to build something ourselves has been really hard but rewarding. And I know the next time, if we're given that opportunity, um, we're going to have, you know, a better head on our shoulders to be able to make the decision and know what we're getting into. So right now you're entirely independent. Yeah. Enti- and that's entirely. Remarkable. Entirely. That's remarkable, you guys. Thanks. It's a Thanks. testament to the hard work and what a good song can really do for an act. Yeah. 
Because so. I know we there's no shortage of good music in this town, but some people who have sometimes the best songs may not put in that extra work to get the song where it needs to be. Yeah. And oh. then why early on, I knew that I wasn't going to be a full-time stage performer, but I knew that I can work harder and I'm really good at the business side, which is why I really early on fell into promotion and things like that. So yeah. that if you can just work hard, that's something that's eventually going to fall into your lap. Yeah. I think that's the X factor, really, because, I mean, you do have to have something that sets everybody apart, right? Because to your point, right. like, everyone's so talented. So there has to be, like, a differentiating thing right. there. I think it's the work. Yeah, you can't just be the same exact thing version of something that's already happened and been successful because we like i always tell young people who've moved to nashville who are like i'm gonna be the next taylor swift and i have to give them a caveat i apologize for sounding like an ass but no you're not because taylor swift is still taylor, taylor swift, swift. Yeah, exactly. yeah. you're not gonna be the next one because she's still here totally. so carve a new path mm -hmm. Absolutely. create your own sound and that's something that i think you guys have done wonderfully Oh, thank thank you. And when I was listening to your music yesterday, I was really starting to think about the uh, dynamic as a duo because I've been in bands like rock bands mm -hmm. and I've been in duos, country duos, and they're difficult. But you guys seem to have a good dynamic that you've put in place where there's not a one singer. You're, you're right. both equal parts in every song, it seems like. Thanks for recognizing that. Thank you. Uh, sometimes we we really think about that and what we are, what our brand is, what makes us different and unique. Sometimes people don't care about that at all. <laughs> is that a deliberate <laughs> choice that you guys made early on as a as a duo? Ooh, uh, I'd say so. I'd say so. We've yeah. talked a lot about it. I mean, uh, over the years, we've always said I feel like that's different in a duo because you do always typically have the lead singer, or you know, they'll say it's a duo, but there's really one guy that sings lead mostly, and the other guy is the harmony guy. So I feel like we definitely made a conscious effort since the beginning. Yeah. I feel like all the big duos in country music, and there's nothing wrong with that at all, but we really wanted to say, well, we feel like we are a true duo because there's not a lead singer. Like Trey can do harmony on one song. I can do harmony on one song. We can go in and out multiple times on one song, and you would never know as long as that sound is there, especially right. when you hit the chorus, like you're going to recognize that Smithfield. It's your signature sound. Totally. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. It's what you guys have, like, what I was saying earlier, you carved your own path because clearly country duos are not something new, but you right. found a way to make it sound new. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll it's, appreciate it's that. It's a testament to good work. Thank you. Well, <laughs> it's the differentiating factor, see? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about your songwriting process because I know for myself, when I was in a duo, we both offered different things to a song like... I'm more of a musical person. I would write the chords, the riffs, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the other person was a little bit more uh, lyrical. Yeah. Is there is there a dynamic like that between the both of you? Or do you both uh, contribute kind of the same things? I'd say it's similar. Yeah. That. In some ways, I feel like sometimes, you know, we always talk about our ideas and our stories and songs and whatever. Sometimes Trey does walk in the writer's room and he's like, hey, I have this really great, you know, melody. Um and I have like the title or whatnot. But then there's also other times where like just recently I was like, hey, Trey, I like sang him some parts. I'm like, you know, like the idea I had for the summer song I wanted to write. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that doesn't happen super often, but it does happen to where I have the melody and then he can help me bring that to life. Um, just depends. I mean, it, it, it's kind it, of a, yeah. it just depends on the day. I mean, somebody walks in sometimes with the full, you know, almost the full song written and they're just like, hey, I got the verse and the chorus and I just need to finish it out, you know. So it just, it depends. That's great. Yeah. So you're not always coming in with a blank slate. Sometimes you're coming in half done and needing someone to give it that extra little push. Yes. Yeah, you know, and I, I do think that uh, co-writing is such an important part of the Nashville community. Absolutely. You know, if you're going to be part of the community, co-writing is just a must. And so it's like, I, I hear people all the time talk about like, well, I wrote this song by myself. And I'm like, that's cool. But if you, it's, it's like a balance, right? Mm -hmm. You almost have to do both because if you do by yourself too much, then you kind of isolate yourself on an island. But, you know, if you'd never do that, then it's like, okay, well, are they really a writer? So it's just kind of like balance, balance. That's something that I've noticed that's like very distinctively different about Nashville compared to Los Angeles and New York is those towns are often like very cutthroat to get ahead. Yeah. And Nashville is more of like, oh, you, you got a deal. I want my friends to come have the deal with me. So you all go get to do the cool thing together because – I always like to give the metaphors like no one 
wants to get to a mountaintop peak right. and not have somebody to high five. Yeah. yeah. Like nobody wants to do that alone. And then if you get to come back down alone, who do you talk to? Totally. Sure. So, of course, there's going to be waves of success. But if you have success and then you lose it all, then what? Totally. So really why not keep your friends with you the whole time? And that's what Nashville really does well. I would agree. Yeah, Na- Nashville, the music industry, it's funny. It is totally different from any other place. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think you do have to have that sense of community. Yeah. But it can also be – like I want to be real here. Like it, it can be tough too because I will say when – We were signed, you know, everybody wanted to hang with us, write with us. And then when the label folded, those same people that like you poured two years of writing songs with and you thought were like your life, life or friends, all of a sudden don't text you back, don't call you back, don't want to write with you anymore. So that has happened to us a a few times. But I will say there's been a few people that have stuck by us through everything. And those are the people I want to be high fiving. Absolutely. You know, it's important to know that because I know, especially for a lot of the younger listeners out there, they think that like, oh, I got the deal. I made it. (laughs) You can lose the deal just as quickly as you get it. Yep. And that's why it's important not to forget that. Yeah. I mean, statistically speaking on a record label, I mean, you have a better chance of not being the Luke Bryan or the Carrie Underwood, Mm -hmm. a much better chance of not being that than being that. Like the percentage is very offsetting. Um, So, and that's just something you have to understand the risk of. For every Luke Bryan, Jason Aldean, they have a thousand people who exactly didn't perform well on Spotify and they got cut six months after. Totally. It happens all the time. Yeah. And it's the risk you take on, you know. Absolutely. But you are, it's just like going to a casino. You're gambling that you're going to get to play Nissan Stadium. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely. right. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing is at the end of the day, they do have the means to get you there. You know? Right. So that's the risk reward, right? It's like the reward is up here. That's Nissan Stadium that they do have a path to get you to. Mm-hmm. The risk is just getting dropped after six months. Exactly. So. They yeah. don't want to lose too much money. That's yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> or they shelf you. They don't ever put you or out. You. We've yeah. had you know friends that were on the first label with us that signed major deals right after because they were just a little bit farther ahead. So you know they you know we had never put out music at that point, so nobody was interested after that. But um, a few people you know signed elsewhere and never got put out. So with the uh, discussion of songwriting specifically and co-writing yet further. Is it you two always with additional writers or do you often, Trey, go and write with some people? Jennifer, do you go write with people and then you bring an idea uh, after the fact? It's usually always together Okay, just because like I feel like, yes, we're a duo and we are a team and we approve of everything that we say throughout the song. But we're also individuals too. Right. And there has to be some of Trey's individual personality in that song when it's his verse and vice versa for me. So I do think if it's a Smithfield song, we've always, you know, tried to make it important that we're both there and we're both active in it and we both feel the story and feel what we're saying. I think that's so important. You can't drive a bicycle with only one wheel. That's yeah, true. that's true. I mean, I guess some people can if it's a unicycle, but <laughs> but I will say I'm not that talented though. When it comes to our Christmas music, Trey has a little secret talent for writing. He is really good I at Christmas. I love Christmas music. music. You know, it's a hidden gem too because mm-hmm. like <laughs> he's really good. <laughs> well, okay, well it, that's happenstance. So we're releasing another original Christmas song this year. I've happened to have written both of them myself. Yeah, and, and I stay out of it because I'm like, this is cheesy in the best way, and it works, and <laughs> you're really good at this. But like, I, with Christmas music, you can get away with the cheese, you know? Because it's like, think about Christmas music. You're not really sitting there listening to it intently for all the mm-hmm. lyrics. You're opening presents. You're putting up Christmas decorations. You're it's hanging an out atmosphere. Your, it's an atmosphere. Yes. As long it's as the atmosphere. vibe is there and the feeling is there, that's all people care about in Christmas music. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, I'm glad to meet somebody else who loves writing Christmas music because when I start writing Christmas music in July – <laughs> it feels kind of out of season because honestly, I want to make like hot cocoa and sit by the fireplace at my yep. house, and it's 110 degrees, and I yeah. can't do that. <laughs> exactly, it's not the vibe. <laughs> Absolutely, no. I, I've always loved Christmas music. So uh, I do know I did a little research, obviously, but uh, Newtown, the EP that came mm-hmm. out last year, yes. debuted at number one on the iTunes country charts. Correct? Yeah, that it did. Yes. What did that feel like? Oh, that was incredible. I mean, the crazy thing about that was at the time, I mean, Morgan Wallen's, you know, double album was rocking. And so we just assumed at that point, like, there's there's no way. Like you It was know. like number one for 22 weeks straight on yep. iTunes. Yeah. Um, and Walker Hayes, too, with Fancy Like, had just dropped two weeks prior to that, which, 
you know, Fancy Like was the number one single, but it was also ramping up his sales for his EP. Right. So we just thought. Yeah, we didn't think there was It's tough way. competition in country music. Yeah. It is very tough. And so I just started like texting her incessantly at midnight when it dropped and I saw it, you know, hit number one. I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. You're like, wake up, wake up, yeah, wake yeah. up. Which, you know, grandma over here goes to sleep really early. So she's just out. And so I'm just like <laughs> freaking out by myself. And I'm like, I guess she'll find out in the morning. But I mean, and it was still there. I mean, it was number one for a few days and um, held its position. You know, again, not being on a major label, you don't have those major marketing dollars to, you know, make that, you know, really last. But the fact that we were able to do that independently, um, it was amazing. It was our best release we've ever had. We That's were awesome. like really, really proud. So I know a lot of our listeners are these independent artists similar to you guys. So can you give them any advice for releasing something independently? I know it's going to be clearly very difficult breaking a number one, but how did how did that happen for you guys? Did you have any marketing team behind it, or was it just the two of you, grassroots, trying your best? Yeah, I mean, we definitely had a marketing team. Um, and I feel like you, you need some kind of help there, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about assembling that team, making it work for you. It's social media. It's I mean, you can speak more to that than I yeah, can, I but as an say, independent artist, that is so important. We had the record done. We had, we did a Kickstarter. Because first of all, you have to have the money to make right. the record. <laughs> so yeah. we did a Kickstarter to raise the money um, to make the record and then also use some of that for, for promo dollars. We used a very small team in Nashville called Quentin Digital. Amanda Quentin's amazing. So if you guys, you know, you're looking for that. Shout she, out. Shout out to her because she would do a great job. But she had a team of, of four girls. And um, we decided on the singles. Um, So two singles came out. So there was like a lead up to it. We had about Mm. a seven month lead up to the release of this EP. And it started Mm, with just doing music videos for both singles, um, you know, making sure that those singles were were playlisted and talked about. We used some of the money to hire a publicist to get us in, you know, some good publications like People and Mm -hmm. Rolling Stone and talk about the record. I think the buildup is really, really important. But honestly, at the end of the day, me and Trey were on I hate to say it, but TikTok and Instagram and making videos ourselves. The marketing team did not make those for us every single day. Teasing our music, talking about how we wrote the songs. What do you think about this clip? Does this clip remind you of the person you love? Share this if this makes you think of this. Like that was all me and Trey. It's that's the modern day literally going knocking door to door. Very much so. You can hire the best team in this town, and it will not matter if you are not putting in Mm -hmm. the work and adding your individuality, or in this case, two individualities, (laughs) two people's personalities in one page and showcasing what makes you unique and special and finding that audience. And so all of that lead up, I mean, we spent, and this, again, this might sound like a lot to an indie. It's nothing compared to what major labels spent, but maybe like... 5k on advertising on social media like hey pre-order this song or pre-save this song when you pre-order before a release that helps you chart Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day if we didn't have a couple tiktok videos really pop off on that music i don't know that it would have gone number one even with the advertisement it's a testament to the power of social media we all kind of hate it a yeah. little bit I mean, deep down. Uh, yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. burn, we're burnt out. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, I'll be so real here. You um, love to hate it, you know. Yeah. That kind of that kind of relationship and TikTok specifically. I hate to like preach this, but it's just true. As an independent mm-hmm. artist, there's so many like channels available to get your marketing out there and get the word out there that require a certain amount of money or a certain amount of resources to reach that audience. I feel like TikTok is one of the rare exceptions to that, where it's a truly level playing field that you have with any other artist, sign, major label, indie, whatever, that you have to reach an audience the same way. And so that's why it's so important as an indie is because it's one of the few truly level marketing playing fields you have as an indie. Because you can go and look at all of these major artists and see some of their videos that have 20 million views, but then you can scroll through their feed and see one that got 25,000. You're like, oh, you're a human also. Yeah. Not yeah. everything has to pop off. So that way when an indie act like you guys actually does, I don't want to say it means more, but let's be honest. It means a it little does. bit more when something pops off. Yeah. It does. No, absolutely. There's no secret about that at all. And that's why it's so important is because it is like it's a fair shot that you have to reach the same audience. Right. Yeah. So what was the first single that 
uh, came out for the record? Um, we decided on Sunday Best. Mm-hmm. Um, we thought that it was just a great message. Our target audience is 18 to 34 year old women. And I think every woman out there just wants to be, and men too, seen for who they are. Right. And so that song is about that. Um, and so we just really felt like it was a strong lead off. We didn't feel like it was like the best song on the record, but we thought it was a strong reintroduction because we hadn't released music. And at that point, about three years, right? We'd released a few like it had been a while singles, but yeah, we'd released one very important song the summer before that called We'll Figure It Out. Mm-hmm. Right. But we, it, it didn't become important till later until right. it was a part of the EP and, and took off on, on TikTok, but we felt like Sunday Best hit our market the best and intro- reintroduced us back into the world um, the best. But it that one honestly didn't really take off. It was the second single that did. It was Something Sexy, which is – Favorite be, of mine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we honestly – we didn't know if we were going to put it on the record because we felt like, well, is this too cheesy or cliche? But we also thought it was very creative. It could have gone either way. Um, but that was the one that really took off for us that helped us like build a fan mm-hmm. base on the platform. And we just kept sharing it over and over and over. And, and that's kind of the one that really led into people wanting to pre-order our EP. Cool. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. You just said something that I think is important to note is that you do have to, it almost seems like overkill sharing the same song over and over and over and over and over again. But eventually one of those might just click with the audience on TikTok for whatever reason. Yeah. And then yeah. 5 million people watch it. And then all of a sudden you have 50,000 pre-saves for a single. And you're like, oh, crap. Like this is why you have to release something 25 times. Because totally. sometimes it might take that much effort to make one thing work. Oh, yeah. That's... And it's the same thing too. And it starts feeling like a broken record really fast. And you're like, God, I've, I've posted the same thing mm-hmm. 50 times. But – You have to understand the platform that you're working on. And on TikTok with the scroll feature, it's like you're reaching new people every single time you post that. You're not reaching the same people. So to them, it's brand new, even though to you it's 50 (laughs) times plus. And you feel like, okay, let's do this again. You just have to understand that about where you're posting. Because with the just sheer volume of people using TikTok and to a lesser degree Instagram, but the opportunity for somebody new to see your content every day to yep. make new fans every day. Yeah. It exists very, very readily. Yeah. Yep. Every time we have a video even semi takeoff, I will say it's getting so saturated now and it's getting very, very hard to have the viral moment as it was in the beginning because I think the platform was just wanting so many people right. to sign up that it was a lot easier. It's getting a lot more competitive and harder now. Still happens for sure. Sure. Um, but I will say every time we've had – one do decently well, we see a direct correlation with our, you know, downloads and streams, which when you're indie, that means everything. Everything. Because that keeps you afloat. That helps me pay my bills. Mm -hmm. That helps me keep creating music and doing what I love to do. So it's very, very valuable for me. And Trey, (laughs) obviously. Uh, When I say I, (laughs) it's always we. We are a true team um, in that. So, you know, we're human too, though. We do get burnout on it and we desire for it just like anybody would any job that you work if you work really hard at it and you're really good at it you know you want a promotion at some point so let's talk about we'll figure it out Mm -hmm. when did you guys write that song that would have been february of 2020 Mm -hmm. yeah right after we got out of our second deal yeah it would have been around february of 2020 Mm -hmm. and uh you know it's funny like i was actually Funny enough, just talking to one of our co-writers last night about this song. And he was like, you know, that was one of those like rare moments where we all left the right with the feel goods. And it was a cool way of saying it because like when you're writing music, you don't always walk away knowing that you did something right. awesome. That's something that could very quickly change your life. Yeah. And I think that was just one of those rare occasions that, you know, there was us and two other co-writers um, that walked away that day and we were just like, we we wrote something meaningful, like that's, and something, that's something that we all feel good about. What's funny is we didn't do anything with it until the following <laughs> June because, you know, a few things happened in between then and June. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> things get lost in the mix. And I was riding in my car one day. And, you know, when you write a song, you make a work tape or a little phone crappy mm-hmm. work tape. And you throw it in the pile and you say, we wrote a song. Here it is. And uh, it just came out of my car and played. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks in that moment. And I pulled the car over and I was crying like in my car. It affected you that No, deeply. No shame. Like man crying in my car. I've done it. And, <laughs> uh <laughs> 
<laughs> and I just, you know, called her and I was just like, hey, this song came on. I don't know. I just feel like we need to record it and put it out. You know, I know we don't have any plans to put out a single. We don't have an album or an EP coming out. We just, I feel like we need to do it. And we called our co-writer and he uh, he helped produce it and sussed it out, did all the vocals and we released it and just said, this is, this is our song, baby, that we feel like the world needs to hear. And uh, the world responded pretty resoundingly with uh, stories about got me through the breakup or this sounds like my relationship or I just lost my job. You know, this is really hitting home right now. And well, it was during the pandemic. That's what I'm saying. So and, just so, and so a lot that. of people just like, there was just some really sensitive nerves in the world that right. got touched on by that. And I feel like we heard a lot of, a lot of stories about it. And that's how it made the record because we had the Newtown EP done at that point, but we didn't release it because it was a pandemic. And we kept hearing rumors like, well, this is going to be over in three weeks. This is going to be over in three months. And so Trey and I were like, okay, well, we'll just wait till everything's back to normal. Then we'll release something. Right. So we were sitting on this great EP, but I'm so glad we didn't release it then because we'll figure it out. comes out just as like a encouraging word to folks, then builds this like, you know, organic audience with it. Mm-hmm. It did not get any playlisting then. It, it wasn't like pushed, had no marketing dollars. And it got such a great reaction, um, again, on TikTok and social media that we were like, we have to put it on this album and re-release it with the rest of our And it's your most streamed song on Spotify now. Yeah. It is. Isn't that that wild? Exactly. It's proof. You never know what you might just be sitting on. Yeah. But I would also say probably the timing of the year that that happened and it was written and released is probably all just a step into what pushed it to becoming what it became. That's I would agree. True. Yeah, I mean, I just think people, for some reason, gravitate to that song. You always hear the word reactive song, and it's just a very reactive song with people. Yeah. And oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, we were late to the TikTok party. Everybody was on it, like, late 2019, 2020, really, when the pandemic hit. And I think me and Trey were like, well, we're not dancers, you know? Right. We're not funny jokesters. Like, we're not going to do all these trendy things. This is this platform's not for us. So we weren't on it at all in 2020. So people didn't really discover we'll figure it out till 2021, which is why it sort of ended up on the record That's later cool. on. So, yeah. but- The lyrics of that are something that I think – it's, it's almost poetry, the beginning of the chorus. Uh, the baby, let me tell you what the truth is. Nobody knows what they're doing. Is that correct? Am I not butchering it? No, you, you didn't. Got it. You, you got, got it. it. I think I think the timelessness of a lyric like that is why that song has performed quite well, is because we're all in our late 20s and 30s, and God, it hurts sometimes when you just <laughs> – oh, you literally – like I remember being 18 and like when I'm 30, I'm going to know what what's going on. I'm going to have a house and <laughs> I'm going to have a house and right, three kids. kids. And you're, you turn 30 and you're like uh, – I don't have yeah. any of this. I have any of that. What happened? <laughs> so we, no one knows what they're doing and that's why I think that song is really resonating with a lot of people is because it's true. Yeah. It's exactly what country music is. It's three chords and the truth. Thank you. Yep. And it's – gosh, it's just a – it's a testament to good songs, good Thank songwriting. You. Thank Who did you. you write that with? I was with a guy named Adam Wood and Emily Landis. Yes. You write with Adam quite a bit, correct? Yeah, Adam has been a longtime collaborator of ours. He's been kind of our, uh, our, our secret sauce, if you will, of just, <laughs> you know, you, you run across people in town that just kind of understand what you do more so than other people. And he was just one of those guys that just from the very start understood what we wanted who we wanted to be, what we wanted to say. And it's just always easy when we write because we're all on the same page with right. that. He's also one that, like I was saying earlier, that stuck by us through it all. And you don't forget that. Mm-hmm. So when you do reach whatever pinnacle in your mind that you, you want to get to, those are the people you should never forget, the ones that stuck by you when, when times were low. And Adam's done that mm-hmm. without a doubt. Absolutely. Well, hey, let's take a quick commercial break and we'll come right back with the Nashville Tour Stop Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Nashville Tour Stop Podcast. This week's episode, we are with Gosh dang, smash country duo. We've got Smithfield <laughs> in the studio today. Guys, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Great to be here. So we've talked a lot about songwriting and the history of the band. Now I want to talk about what's to come. I want to talk about the future. So uh, talk about 
the big show you first have coming up here in uh, in Nashville. Woo-hoo! It is at the Exit Inn here in Nashville, very iconic venue in Nashville. Um, it, it's kind of like iconic in rock and country, though. It is. Yes. But uh, I think it's perfect for us because I come from rock and she comes from country. So it was like, it's basically us in a venue. <laughs> and, uh, and You are exit there. and you are in. Yes. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Wait, why do I have to be exit? No. Um, so that's October 13th. October 13th. And uh, our friend Savannah Kyes is kicking the show Shout off. Out. She's performed Nashville Tour Stat. Oh, and oh, she's awesome. She's wonderful. She's oh, so great. She's fantastic. Like, I'm, I'm just as excited about that, possibly. But um, yeah, so show up early for her and uh, tickets are $15, which, you know, is not that much. So it's, like a, it's like a stop at McDonald's or something. So. <laughs> yeah. So if you're listening to this the day it has come out, uh, this show is just a few weeks away. So. Uh, go get your tickets before it sells out because let's just let's just call it. It's gonna it's gonna cut close. Ooh, it's gonna be awesome. The universe. And, and I will say this: like if you have been to one of our shows in the past, this is gonna be different because we're playing some brand new songs that have never ever been played, performed, heard. Um, they're gonna be releasing next year, so you get kind of a preview before. Oh, that's else. awesome! Yeah, yeah. So that brings us to the next point. You do have new music on the way. Oh, always. always. <laughs> It'd be weird if you're like, no, we're done. No, we're done. <laughs> we're, we're, we're peacing out now. Um, yeah, so there's actually a lot of new music coming out. We have uh, – I'm a Goo Goo Dolls fan until the day I die. They're like my favorite band of all time. Okay. And my favorite song of all time is a song called Iris. You mm-hmm. might be familiar with it as yep. everyone else is. Uh, we did our own version of it, and we're going to release it on October the 7th. Yeah. That's and cool. uh, that's the next release. we got some Christmas music coming out, which is always fun, um, and then some brand new music at the top of next year. A friend of mine actually sings background vocals for Goo Goo Dolls, so maybe Stop. we could uh, maybe we can get you guys in touch. You... Dude, don't even, don't even <laughs> play with me. I think Trey would pass out. Say never meet your don't, heroes. But don't mess with yeah. my heart here. Don't mess with my heart. I would be um, okay, but I think Trey would literally pass out if he if he ever met Johnny. <laughs> that would be one of my only fanboy moments. I'm usually pretty good at like keeping it wrangled in when we meet people. That would be probably one of my only ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's exciting. So new release is coming soon. But uh, I always like to ask certain pointed questions that are dedicated to the acts or guests we have on our shows because a lot of people are solo artists. But when we have a band on, especially people who were friends for so long before the band came into the picture, I want to know how you guys set boundaries between being Jennifer and Trey, the friends, versus Smithfield, the band, where you guys have to work and be basically the next thing. How do yeah. you how do you separate those two lives and how do you how do you set boundaries to integrate them safely? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's not always easy as with it would be with anybody, you know, when you mix those two things, that there's issues and there's things that come up, but I think because of our history and kind of our roots and just our our you know, I mean, we got love for each other and like that's been there for since we were kids, you know. It goes back three generations and I feel like there's a mutual respect there. So no matter what kind of issues come along, we're always able to kind of ground ourselves in that first and foremost. Um, and I think it's just talking things out. It's about being diligent on the business and also being diligent on the friendship. You got to give a little bit of love to, to both. So do you, what do yeah. you guys do for the, the friendship aspect of it? Do you, do you guys have hobbies that you like to go do together, hiking, bowling, anything like that? Yeah. Well, we we both really love coffee. Okay. So someday, like we've talked about, like if Smithfield was to come to an end and we don't want to tour anymore, like what would we do? Because we are such good friends and we are such good partners together. I think we'll I, – at least I hope that we will always work together in some capacity – and so we've talked about, you know, um, wanting to do a coffee shop someday. But we love – that's one of our favorite things to do when we travel or even here in Nashville is go to a really good food – we're foodies. So we love good restaurants and – We have Taco um, Saturdays. Taco um, Saturdays. Nice. We, she'll, br- you know. she'll bring her guy and her dog and I'll bring my girl and my dog and we'll just go eat, like eat tacos. Day. Yeah. yeah and-, and coffee shops and we love like good sweets. So I'm talking about food and coffee, which I could talk about for an hour. <laughs> but that's- What are some of your favorite coffee places in Nashville? Oh, Frothy, There's a lot. Frothy Monkey, Ethan Roast. Um, Ethan Roast is a, a favorite place, of mine. Yeah. Ethan Roast is awesome. Honest Coffee. Um, there's a place over in WeHo called Americano Coffee Lounge. Oh, yeah, it's like kind of low key and it's out of the way, but it's so good. Yeah. We love to hike too. Um, yeah. And working out's a big part or just staying active and healthy right. um, is a big part of our lives too. So sometimes we're, we're able to do that together. But I was going to say, Trey's like, it's like family. Like you don't always like each other, 
But right. you always love each other. Oh, that's a great way to put it. That is a good way. And so it. that's how I feel about him. Sometimes I don't like him. Sometimes <laughs> I'm mad or he didn't agree with this or we fought about this or we're stressed about this. But at the end of the day, I love him. I'll have his back no matter what. And I feel that way about him, vice versa. And I think that's what makes Smithfield tick at the end of the day. We are we are family. That's I think it's, it's important to remember that, that even even if you're upset with one another, that you still love each other. Yes. And that, that you always have that to fall back on. Yeah. Even if the friendship is tested for a day, you can always remember that there's something greater than that beyond it. Yeah. And I mean, if we broke up, you know, we'd still have to run into each other at different family <laughs> gatherings. That would just be awkward. We can't have that. So. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's no, times, no escaping it. I think when we're together a lot, uh, especially when a heavy touring season or if it's a stressful season, knowing that, okay, there's a time to shut off Smithfield. You need a few days to yourself. Mm-hmm. I need a few days to myself. And then we can come back and recollect, you know. Those stresses will be there. And right. so I think we've done a, a real as good of anybody that could do a job of keeping that balance. Mm-hmm. I think I agree. that's why we've lasted so long. <laughs> you have to still remember that even though you're a band, that you're both still people. Yeah. yeah. And that was harder. That mm-hmm. was really hard to, f- to figure that out. And then still, we're still figuring it out. Everybody is. But we'll, wow. fig- we'll figure it out. Yeah. Just we'll did figure it. it out. We always do. <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> So you just had a new single called Life and Living come out on August 12th. Yeah. Um, wonderful song. Thank, Thank you. you. Gosh, I was listening to it right before you got here. Did you listen all the way through the I, outro? I listened to it about eight times, so Great. yes. Oh, okay. so, so yes, yeah. <laughs> yep. So Nashville being the country music hub, there's so many places and things that people in this town, especially people who are musicians, want to come and do – You've gotten to live literally tens of thousands of people's dreams. You've gotten to perform at the Granville Opry. Can you tell me how that came to be? Especially the first time where I'm sure you were stunned. The debut, yeah. The debut. Yeah, it, for me, it, I always say it was like the Super Bowl of Opry's because in Texas we have – a lot of small town Opry. So every little small town around at least the Dallas area, North Texas area, we have, you know, like the Red Oak Opry, the Waxhatchee Opry, the, you know, name whatever town Opry. So that's what I actually grew up doing. Okay, mm-hmm. That's how I learned to perform and be on a stage and interact with people. And it was always country music, of course. So when we got the call to do our Grand Ole Opry debut, I was like, oh my God, this is like, this is the Mecca. Like yeah. I have made it, you know? <laughs> Um, but how it came to be is a total Nashville story. Um, we were playing, um, the listening room cafe. Uh, was this the old the listening old, room? Yeah, the, yeah, old, listening the room. old listening room. And, you know, sometimes we would play there. It, I mean, now it's like, you can't hardly get a ticket to go see a show, but then it was like hit or miss, right? Some days there'd be five people. Some days there'd be, you know, it packed 300 people house. So this particular time, it was not very busy. There was this sweet girl in the audience who would travel from St. Louis to come see us play every time we would play there. We'd play there about twice a month. Well, she started interning for the GM of the Opry at the time. Wow. And she um, is interning with him, and she is telling him about this act. She just comes to town to see and that she just loves, and we've got to meet. We've got to meet. She tells him this for over a year. Wow. Like, you've got to see this act. So one night he shows up to our uh, show at Acme Feed and Seed Mm -hmm. before the Opry. So he has to be at the Opry to run the Opry. (laughs) Yeah, he's like on his way to work, basically. (laughs) Yeah. He comes in. I think he stayed, what, 20 minutes, 30 minutes? Something like that. Well, we we didn't even actually – I didn't see him. I, I did. I, Maybe you did. Yeah, I saw him in the corner, and and he came, and then we had a meeting. We, you know, he asked us to go to lunch, and um, he became our mentor. Wow. After that, and and a friend, and um, we, you know, years later we ended up working together. But at that time, I think he watched us just work so hard, and we hadn't even put out music yet, and and we were about to put out our first EP, and. You know, I think he just watched how hard we worked to make some things happen, and he, you know, gave this the green light. That is as Nashville story as it gets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's an important thing to remember is that even at the gigs where there might not be 300 people, Mm -hmm. you have to perform like there's 300 people there. And it's hard. Because you never know (laughs) know. whose intern might be there watching you. That's That's right. right. Absolutely. 
I've done hundreds of shows where people will sometimes crush it and then sometimes half-ass it. And I have to remind myself that like, it's okay. Someone's going to half-ass it. They're probably not going to get to the Opry because they're half-assing it. And that's why you have to give 110% eight days a week. Absolutely. Because eventually someone's intern is going to come watch you and love you. Mm -hmm. Could very well happen. Yeah. So Do Do it for the interns. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely, because the big guys ain't showing up. <laughs> they ain't coming out. <laughs> That's right. So if you're listening to this the day that it's come out, that is uh, Thursday this week. Tomorrow is uh, Smithfield at Rockwood Music Ooh. Hall up in New York City. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry if you're listening to this after the fact, but if you're listening to this the day it's released or Friday, go see Smithfield at Rockwood Music Hall in New York City, stage three which is where Nashville Tour Stop actually had its first tour date in 2019. Whoa. It's a wonderful venue, and uh, you guys said you hadn't been there before. Never have. You are in for a treat. I'm excited. You've hyped it up, so now I have high expectations. (laughs) They've got a cool little green room and a really intimate songwriter venue. There's a big grand piano on the stage. so That's awesome. You're going to love it. We're it's going to be great. I love that kind of atmosphere for this tour, too, because it's all acoustic and it's very like storytelling and just hearing the harmonies. It's all about that. Tickets are 12 bucks. You can get those online. But also, there's so many more tour dates coming up this <laughs> fall. That brings me to what I can call our last point here. Can you guys give us your plugs? Tell our listeners where they can find you online. At Smithfield Music, make sure you put the music. This is like the worst dad joke you'll hear all day. But if you don't put music, you'll get a ham and bacon company. I did (laughs) that earlier. There you go. So you have to put (laughs) smithfieldmusic.com. You can find all of our music on there. You can find all all of our social links are at Smithfield Music. So that is how you will find us. Um, We are going to be touring um, like 10, 15 major market cities this fall. So please make sure you check out our tour dates. See if we're coming to a city near you. Smithfieldmusic.com slash tour. Slash tour. They're going to be in New York, Pennsylvania, South Carolina. They'll be in Knoxville, Tennessee. They're going to be here at the Exit Inn on October 13th with Savannah Kai's opening up. They're also going to be in Chicago, Michigan, Texas, Texas, Texas. Yes. Got to end it with Texas. Yes. Bring it back home, man. (laughs) But check out Smithfield. Excuse me, man. I just did you it. Almost did I just it. did it. Smithfieldmusic.com slash tour <laughs> to keep up with all of their dates. Go see them live. Come see them live in Nashville. I'll be there. I know we'll have our Yay. friends there. And uh, guys, is there anything else you'd like to say before we uh, finish up the episode this week? Yeah, I would just like to say if you know us or you know our music and you've streamed it or supported us in any way, I want you to know how much it means to us that you are a part of our dream. There is no label behind this. It's me and Trey and and you guys. And you guys are making this happen. You help us get booked. You help us continue to do what we love to do. So um, if you've taken that time for us, thank you. Well spoken by Jennifer and Trey of Smithfield Guys, thank you for being on the podcast. You're going to listen to Life and Living, the outro song of the week and the current single of Smithfield right now. In the meantime, you can check us out at NashvilleTourStop.com and find out all of our live event dates there. You can also follow us on social media at Nashville Tour Stop. Thank you for being here, you guys. Cheers until the next time. And until <laughs> the next week, please do remember that all roads lead right back here to the Nashville Tour Stop. If I ain't in your arms, but one night without your touch would tear me apart, I'd be a whole damn mess. Wouldn't get that far without you. I'd still wake up tomorrow if you left me today. Time wouldn't stop, the world wouldn't change. I would survive, I'd get by either way, but I'd want you. You to stay Cause you know if you didn't I would just be existing Your love is the difference Between life and living